I'm Jenny Yang. I'm a communications designer originally from the UK. I studied architecture at the Bartlett in London. I very soon realised that I was more interested in exploring the built environment through the written word than actually designing it. It was this shift in focus that led me to work with various design companies on their communication strategies. After a number of years working with others on their design ideas and styles, I wanted to hone my own craft and explore a subject that I was passionate about. Having lived and travelled abroad my entire life, travel is something that means a lot to me. And this is what led me to do my research here at SVA. Hi, I'm Jenny Yang. This is one of the photos I took during my recent stay at the Hotel Rue des Alpes. And this is another photo of my room there. It looked like this for the entire five days I was guest at the hotel. Housekeeping didn't have to tidy up because I didn't even leave my apartment in Brooklyn. That's because this hotel is completely fictional and the 3D rendering is entirely online. You can relax, take a walk and enjoy the views without the cost or inconveniences of physically moving location. Although the visual quality of Vuda's Alp is not realistic enough to convince us that we're really in the Alps, it's a good example of a phenomenon that we're seeing more frequently in travel. The ability to travel without moving, or what I've defined as non-travel. Non-travel is elicited through the images, the objects, and the tools that we use to experience travel. These devices allow us to travel without the need to be physically present in the place we are visiting. How successful these devices are in, el in eliciting an experience of non-travel comes down to how well they create the myth of travel, and how much we believe this myth directly influences how much we feel like we are traveling, or in this case, non-traveling. Much like Margaret Mark Auger defines non-place, but not as the opposite of place, non-travel is not the opposite of travel. In fact, in many ways, non-travel cannot exist without travel, which is why non-travel follows a similar history to travel itself. I'm going to take you on a brief history of travel so that we can chart how non-travel devices have evolved over time. Travel dates back to the first explorers and the pilgrimages of the 13th and 14th century, centuries through the educational rite of passage in the 17th and 18th century that was the Grand Tour to the explosion of air travel, advertising and mass tourism in the 20th century. The three phases of travel and hence non-travel that we're going to look at are the souvenirs and travel writing of the 18th and 19th century, the importance of the image and the birth of photography in the 20th century, and finally, non-travel in the digital age. So let's start with the Grand Tour. Non-travel exists in the paintings, artifacts, and words that have been collected through travel, like in the collection that Sir John Soen brought back from his Grand Tour and fills his home in London. By visiting the museum, you can take a trip through time and space to many cities in Europe. Italy was a key destination on the Grand Tour, and these prints by Piranesi became hugely popular as a way of visitors to take home something that they had seen. They showed the typical tourist views of Rome that subsequent visitors then sought out on their trips. In 1794, Xavier de Maistre took a 42-day journey around his room through the objects that he had collected within it. He wrote about his journeys, and this spawned a new genre of travel writing known as room travel. De Maistre's room travel is an example of a new form of traveling without moving that came through reading, otherwise known as armchair traveling. The second shift in non-travel is connected to the birth of photography, and most importantly, the invention of the first affordable camera in the 1900s, which made taking photos accessible to the general public and had a profound impact on tourism. It explains what and how we look at tourist sites today. For example, this photo from a Kodak booth at the 1939 World's Fair in New York shows the role that Kodak had in framing tourist views. The world's fairs and exhibitions <coughs> became tourist attractions in their own right, advertised as trips around the world in a day. Photography also explains what we take away with us when we leave a place. Susan Sontag wrote that tourists feel obliged to put the camera between themselves and what they encounter, taking photos and transforming places into graspable objects that can be passed from one to another. And it is these images of travel the photos, adverts, brochures, magazines that we look at that are the first step in taking a trip. These images contain signs or symbols of travel that contribute towards the myth. We create a picture in our mind out of these signs of where we want to go and what it will feel like to be there. It is these anticipatory journeys through images that form the basis of non-travel. 
The passport is frequently used in travel imagery as a sign of going somewhere. It also activates its own journeys to the memories of our previous trips held within its stamps. I think one of the most compelling non-travel photographers is Murad Osman, who takes photos of his girlfriend leading him around the world. All we can see in the photos is Osman's hand and his girlfriend's back. The anonymity and the attractiveness of these photos make us want to be her, or be the one holding her hand. It gives us the agency we need to take this leap into non-travel. Words also help transport us to a different place. Here, the description, going to put in some serious time on this sun deck, allows us to imagine ourselves by the pool doing the same. There is a trend today to, to design products that tell a story, whether it be through words or images, and travel is no different. The third shift that has happened in travel is due to the impact of technology. Today, the traveler has a large number of digital technologies at their disposal to help plan, explore, and share their adventures. Traditionally, there have been three phases of travel, before, during, and after. But digital technologies have blurred these boundaries, and we now plan and share simultaneously in the very moment of travel. The shift from analog to digital allows us to see the way in which these devices are changing our experience of travel and increasing the possibility for non-travel. For example, conversations around real-time storytelling using tools like Snapchat and Periscope were part of the New York Travel Festival just last month. It is changes like this that are ripe for analysis, especially from the design perspective. So far, we've only looked at two-dimensional images, but three-dimensional and virtual reality devices open up new possibilities for creating immersive and performative non-travel experiences. This example is particularly interesting because the lady in the photo is only sat a few meters away from the temple in India that she is exploring through the virtual reality headset she is wearing. But the temple is so small and there are so many visitors that she can't fit inside. The lady has taken off her shoes and she's sat praying. There are many questions about the authenticity of travel, let alone non-travel, but it seems the proximity of the temple helps create an, author an authentic sense of being there. On the other hand, this project by Marriott Hotels seems to negate the, the need to travel entirely. The user has already traveled to a hotel in either London or New York, and they are sat in their room with a headset on, experiencing a short clip of another person's trip in Beijing, Rwanda, or Chile. It raises questions as to what constitutes as travel and why you would want to experience someone else's travels while you could be out there exploring the city you're already in. Marriott have also created other virtual reality experiences. <coughs> this one is more vivid and uses four-dimensional technologies. In this case, you're in a booth the size of an elevator where you're teleported to a beach in Maui. You can hear the waves lapping at your feet as well as feel the wind in your hair, the sun on your face, and the faint sensation of sea spray. The more we can feel and interact with the environment we're visiting, the more we believe that we're really there. And then this is taken one step further by the shoe company Merrill, who created this virtual reality installation last year. It allows you to physically move around the space, carefully traversing a treacherous rope bridge in the Dolomites before being caught in an avalanche. While the quality of these projects are constantly improving and are a vast improvement on the hotel I showed you at the beginning, there's still a lack of interaction. You can't choose from more than a limited range of destinations. You can't move around or physically interact with your environment or the people within it. Today, the focus of designers like Tyler Hopgear, who's joined us, is on creating new ways to allow users to interact more directly with our virtual reality environment. This diagram illustrates one definition of virtual reality that is based on the level of vividness and interactivity which determine whether we believe we are present in a place. As the quality of the technologies involved improve and we can interact with all our senses, virtual reality experiences will be, will be perceived as more real and more authentic. This diagram really resonated with me when I was trying to define non-travel because in the same way, non-travel is made up of a combination of imaginative mobility and physical feeling of being in a place. The more convincing these elements are, the easier it is to non-travel. To date, the biggest interest in the travel world is how virtual reality can be used in marketing, convincing potential travelers to book a holiday by giving them a taste of it. However, virtual reality also allows us to reduce the environmental impact of traveling, both in terms of the energy required to transport ourselves there and the effect we have, for example, on heritage sites. It allows us access to restricted sites like the temple example in India and at little or no cost, which could have a huge benefit in education 
allowing more students to be involved in class trips and experience places outside of the classroom firsthand. As someone that loves to travel, there is no way that I can advocate that non-travel is the future of travel and that we shouldn't travel abroad. But as Proust says, discovery is not about seeing new sights, but about looking with new eyes. And in many ways, these non-travel devices become these other eyes. As my own, own contribution to this, I'm, propo I'm proposing a travel guide to New York as a way of experiencing other cities around the world, seeing the sights, tasting the food, hearing the music of other places without having to leave New York City. It would contain a collection of itineraries visiting other cities through the museums, shops, buildings, monuments, restaurants, and activities that can be found in New York, a city rich in the culture of different communities. For example, you could spend the day exploring Paris, visiting one of Guimard's Art Nouveau metro station entrances in the Garden of MoMA, and taking a photo that every first-time visitor to Paris takes. Picking up a souvenir read from this French language bookshop on the Upper East Side. Did you know that there's a replica of the Eiffel Tower on top of a hotel in Long Island City? And have you visited the most authentic Parisian bistro in the Bowery? At the moment, these examples are fairly obvious and stereotypically French, but with more time and research, I would hope to make them more nuanced and a way of learning something more about or something new about New York City, as well as other destination cities. As such, this book will not only be for those who come to visit New York, it will also be for New Yorkers that want to explore and non-travel through their home city, setting foot on one's own country as a foreign land. Thank you.